my favorite sermons to, to, to teach are the ones that are personal, something that I have personally learned. And uh, this one definitely falls under that heading. Um, for, for a long time, actually until this year, I had this idea that you know, I needed to be a good Christian. Now, if, you know, a, a good Christian is basically where you reach this pinnacle of perfection where you just don't need to grow anymore. And you don't need God anymore because you're just such a good Christian, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, hey, I, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm doing a good job. You know, we have our little checklist, you know, here. Hey, it's not clicking, Ben. Oh, well, that would, that would fix it. Do you want me to throw it back to you or? You know, the funny thing about technology is you actually have to use it correctly in order for it to work. That's why I don't have a smartphone, because I can't figure it out. I don't want to waste the time trying to figure it out either. Um, <laughs> Siri, how do I use you? Oh, there we go. Okay. So we have our checklist. You know, here we go. Here's proof that I'm a good Christian. Okay, I pay tithes. Check. I go to church. Check. I read my Bible. Check. I pray. Okay, that makes me a good Christian. And... Uh, for a long time, well, it's doing all kinds of stuff now. It thinks it knows best. It's a smart, uh, smart uh, screen. Uh, well, for the, you know, so we get this kind of mentality going, and then we kind of get this pride in ourselves. You know, hey, I'm hot stuff. I am the definition of righteousness. I am a good Christian. I have arrived. And uh, you know, it's all about me. I don't need God anymore. It's just I'm a self-sustaining Christian. And then God brings these bad things by to remind us, hey, you know, maybe you aren't hot stuff. And it's like, ah, ah. You know, another good example is um, a lot of times we go to church to get fed. That's a great example. Um, and then, you know, we do our Sunday routine and then the week is our own, right? You know, the world is my oyster from Monday through Saturday. And then Sunday, you know, I, I do my due diligence. <laughs> uh, so in this, I just wanted to share with you what I've been learning about being a good Christian. First off, to be a good Christian means that you are maturing. Now, what does that mean? It means that you are growing. If you're a Christian, you're a good Christian because you're growing in Christ. That's the idea. But don't get the idea of it as I'm a good Christian and everybody else is less than me. So look at it like this. Either you're growing in Christ or you are seeking your own desires. That's kind of how that works. If you're growing, that means you're a Christian. And that means Christ has made you righteous. So I guess if you want to look at it like that, you're a good Christian. So what makes us maturing Christians? Well, the first thing is in Hebrews chapter 5, um, chapter 5, verse 12. And going through verse 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So he's talking about practicing, he's talking about maturing, he's talking about the process that takes place there. But in verse 13... He said this, you ought to be teachers. And then he says, you know, pass the milk. So what he's saying is there are some things that you cannot learn until you grow in Christ. But you can't really grow in Christ unless you, blam, serve people. Mature Christians serve people. Well, let me come back to that. So what is it? There's a lot of ways to serve people. There's... You know, there's teaching, obviously, uh, there's things, but there's other things that people oftentimes overlook, cleaning. You know, I got to brag on, on Kirk and Renee for a second. You know, I used to have to do all the cleaning uh, myself every Wednesday and every Saturday. I, don't get embarrassed, don't get embarrassed. Uh, I used to have to do all the cleaning myself, and then Kirk and Renee started doing almost all of it. It's just a rare occasion that I ever have to clean anything, and that is just such... A blessing to not have to waste that much of my time on cleaning. I mean, I, it's not that it's a waste of time. It's just that 
how when you do it every single week, it's like, ah, I want to be doing anything else but this. <laughs> I, you know, it's like if you've, if you've had kids and you have to clean up after your kids. I just cleaned up this mess. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so cleaning, prison, uh, visiting people in prison and hospital, children and youth ministries. A lot of times, I grew up in a church environment that was very legalistic. You had people complaining about everything but not willing to do anything about it. Oh, people shouldn't be having abortions, but I'm not going to do anything to help them raise their kids. I'm not going to do anything to help people. I'm just going to complain about the way things are, but I'm not going to leave my comfort zone to help it get better. Oh, it happens the same way in church, too. Pastor, you need to have a better kids program. I'm not going to volunteer for it, but you need to have a better one. See what I mean? That idea of you serve me, but mature Christians serve other people. Not, come, not always coming to get fed, not always having it about you, but realizing it's about God and sacrificing yourself like that. That's hard because we want to be served. It's a lot easier to be served. You know, we can get in our nice little rut and we can live life on our terms, assuming that nothing comes by and messes our plans up. Um, so obviously the point here about a mature Christian isn't being in church 100 years, nor is it knowing the whole Bible. See, I grew up in an environment where that's exactly what it was. If you went to church for, for, from the day you were born, man, you were, you were a top-notch Christian. You could look down at everybody else. As long as you knew about the Bible, it didn't even matter if you fulfilled the things in the Bible. It was just about the knowledge. But if the knowledge doesn't lead to action, it's kind of pointless. You, you know, you can have all the knowledge in the whole world in your brain, and when you get older, you still risk... You know, Alzheimer's, for instance, death, when you die, you're not going to be able, to, all your knowledge isn't going to mean much of anything. All your books and all your wonderful things that you've accumulated throughout your life, it's not going to benefit you when you die. I mean, it's just things. Um, number two, Philippians uh, chapter one. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 through 30. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. And then in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, we see something pretty much along the same lines. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So here we have number two. Mature Christians suffer for Christ. Now, notice that last part, for Christ. Not you cause a bunch of problems and then you reap what you have sown. Because <laughs> if you're anything like me, you like to tell people off, and then when they get upset at you, it's like, hey, that's not fair. You're just supposed to kind of take it, and then I'm the good guy, and you're the idiot, you know. But that's not what mature Christians do. <laughs> um, so not just suffering for Christ, but also the idea of enduring. And, uh, well, I'll skip past that. Sometimes you write things in a sermon, and you look at it, and you think, eh, let's not look at that. So the third thing uh, is from James chapter 1, so just a few verses down in verse 26, it says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Which takes us to the third thing. Mature Christians don't gossip, complain, and fight. That blew my mind. Because these are things that I've learned this year, by the way. I'm not telling you something that I learned years ago. This year, well, 2018, so technically it was last year, but we're at the beginning of 2019, so roll with me on this. This year, I learned these things. See, I thought all these people who've been in church for forever, they are the symbol of maturity. But here's the thing. The longer you walk with God, the, the easier it is to kind of drift. And when you just kind of hang out in your walk with God, you do things that are stupid that you just kind of justify. I can talk bad about somebody because I've been in the church for a long time, but at least I don't do drugs. 
I can complain about the bastard behind his back because he's doing something really, really stupid. But at least I'm not an alcoholic. You see what I mean? We kind of justify what's okay because I've reached this level of I'm a good Christian so I can do things that good Christians don't do. <laughs> see what I mean? Because I know this. I've got it down pat. You know, and then we have our list of things that are, these are, these are the unforgivable sins, okay? At least I'm not a homosexual. I'm gossiping and backbiting and causing all kinds of problems in the church, but at least I'm not a homosexual. Because that's somehow, that's the defining trait of sin, is homosexuality. But if I tear up a church, if I go from church to church to church spreading problems, that's okay. As long as I'm not a homosexual. And I see it happen all the time, too. You see Christians do it with other things, too. At least I'm a Republican. <laughs> I may have caused 101 problems, but at least I'm a Republican because Jesus was a Republican. <laughs> and uh, you laugh, but these are things that actually I've, I have seen. At least I'm not a drunkard. At least I'm not a druggie. But is that how Jesus reached out? Do you see Jesus making any distinctions between himself and other people anywhere in his ministry? Do you see him stopping people before he heals them and saying, hold on. You, you don't drink, do you? Hold on. Before I, before I reach out to you, you, you've never done drugs, right? See, we don't see God doing that. We see the people who he called to follow him as very diverse people. One of them was a tax collector. Gee, as if they weren't hated enough. Another one was called a zealot. Now, a zealot is basically, um, they were a Jewish radical who believed in um, violence to overthrow Rome, to get them out of, of Israel. Um, they believed that God was on their side to uh, partake of this, um, you know, hatred towards the government. We don't really even see God mention zealots at all. We just see him call a zealot to follow him. Completely silent on the political issue. In fact, he was so focused on his purpose of loving people that the Pharisees even tried to exploit that. Because he wouldn't talk about politics, so they tried to make him talk about it. Hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? So then, Jesus outsmarts him and says, who's, who's on that coin? Oh, Caesar? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. He completely circumnavigated the whole issue. But is that what we do? Or do we define ourselves by whether we're Republican or Democrat? We get in our little circles and we talk about, in fact, I was just talking with Pastor about this this afternoon, talking about CNN or Fox News more than the Bible. Well, they have this interview and da -da -da. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I know. And I know that our current president does dumb things, the same as the last president has done dumb things. People do dumb things. It's what we do. Everybody makes mistakes. So we can either sit around and gossip and complain about everything, or we can focus on the mission like Jesus did. You know, the, the, the Caesar who was in control at the time of Jesus, he did some pretty stupid stuff too. But you don't hear Jesus posting rants on Facebook. You don't hear Jesus wasting time in his ministry, making a division between him and other people. You see him reaching out to people. Remember that. Mature Christians don't resort to gossiping, complaining, and causing uh, fights. And I will tell you this. I've seen a lot of homosexuals in church. I've seen a lot of drunkards in church. And I've seen a lot of druggies in church. And I've never once seen one of them destroy a church. You show me a gossip, and I'll show you a church that is dying. You show me a complainer, and I'll show you a church that's dying. Because you don't have time in your life to complain and worship. It's not something that's possible. You're only going to have time for one. Jesus put it like this. You will only have one master. Who is your master? And your words will go with that. If you think that you're better than other people, you will gossip. You will complain. 
If you think that you are saved because God is just so good, you won't focus on gossiping because it, what's there to gossip about? Oh, well, they're, they're a sinner. I'm worse. Because we as Christians know what to do and we still do the wrong thing. That means that we're even worse than somebody who had never been told the gospel. But yet we're saved by grace, not by our perfection. Both before and after salvation. Somewhere along the line, I thought of it something like this. Okay, I'm saved by grace. I get that. But then after I'm saved, somewhere along the line, I have to prove my worth to God so that I can stay saved. I have to do all the right things so that I can stay with that ticket to heaven. Otherwise, the, t the great ticket chain exchanger, you know, Jesus will be walking down the aisle. You haven't proved yourself. Give me back the ticket. And that's how we see it, but that's not how it works. So we, so the first thing, a mature Christian serves people. The second thing, a second thing, a mature Christian suffers for Christ. The third thing, a mature Christian doesn't gossip, complain, or cause fights. The next thing is also in James. In fact, it's, it's the very next verse, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So it's kind of a two-parter here, um, but we'll just really focus on the one idea here. Mature Christians reach out to lost and hurting people. Orphans were despised back then. They were despised. Widows were despised back then. It, it was a very uh, family-centered culture. And for you to not have a, have a family must have meant that you were just not worthy of it. Somehow God hated you. And, you know, that kind of idea. If you were divorced, it, it, you just could never be reconciled to God. Just no. You know, and uh, most of the time it, in, in Jewish culture, it was actually the man who could just divorce a woman at, at leisure. Um, you, you see that, and if you read the different Gospels, they, they all mention how Jesus was talking about divorce, but they, they reference it differently. And Matthew is written to mostly a Jewish, a Jewish group. So he says, if any man divorces his wife, make, you know, makes her an adulterer. But in Mark, it was written to a more Roman audience. So it says, if any man divorces his wife or any woman divorces her husband, because it was a different culture. See, what, what Jewish men were doing is they were exchanging their wives. There was no faithfulness. It was, I'm making a commitment and now I'm breaking it for no reason. So pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans, to visit the downcast, to, to, to care about those people. In fact, if you were here this morning, that's pretty much what t Pastor talked about in Luke chapter 4, verse... 12 or somewhere around there. He was talking about how um, Jesus was there to set the people free. That's it. So then on, uh, at, the, at the end of that, and to keep oneself unstained by the world, basically obeying God. In fact, I'll we'll go to that next, so just hold on, hold your hats on that. So reaching out to the lost and hurting. I'll give you some, some examples of people who are lost and hurting that as a, uh, as as a whole, the Christian, the American Christian Church, just really has ignored uh, the first group of people would be the transgender people. Well, I don't agree with them, so I'm not going to reach out to them. See what I mean? But they're still hurting. The level of apathy that a church has to have to completely turn their backs on somebody who are so lost that they're willing to cut on themselves just to make themselves feel better. Imagine that. Another group, uh, prostitutes or people who are, let's just say sexually immoral. Um, well, you know, I just don't associate with those kinds of people. What was one of the defining traits of Jesus' ministry? He's hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. That was what he was known for. Is that what we are known for? Is that what we are known for? Another group, foster kids. Well, I want to complain about the problem, but I don't want to adopt. Oh, goodness, no, I don't want to actually adopt. That would mean I have to do something here. It's much more comfortable to complain about a situation than it is to adopt. It's much easier to say, hey, you shouldn't get an abortion than to give our time and our money to help someone who's considering getting an abortion. 
See, it's easier to throw stones than to meet somebody where they are. Pastor said something a couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning that I don't think I will ever forget. He said, we expect people to come to us like Jesus did, acting like Jesus did, and then they'll treat us like Jesus, and then we'll tell them about Jesus. That's not how it works. They come to us as they are, and we go to them as they are, and then we reach out to them, and then they grow. Revolutionary thought, you know, oh, well, this person didn't talk to me, right? So I'm not going to love them. Mature Christians reach out to lost and hurting people. And then the second part of Roman, or James 1.27, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So that brings us to the last thing. Mature Christians live God's way and not our own. Mature Christians live God's way and not, not, not their own. See, a lot of us want to call ourselves a Christian, but then when it really comes down to it, we don't really want to live God's way. We just, we just want to get by. We just want to be good enough to get into heaven, and then I'll just live my life my own way. I'll spend my money my own way. I'll spend my time and my life my own way. And if God ever calls me to do something that's not comfortable, I'm not going to do it. Tell you what, this is something that I struggle with. My greatest fear in life is that God will call me to be a pastor. And I'm talking about a senior pastor. I know I'm an associate pastor right now, but oh boy, can you imagine being a senior pastor? The amount of, the amount of people who, who come to you and say, hey, you need to do this better. Or hey, I've got money. I didn't plan at all, so I just headed down the highway. And I broke down, so you need to pay for it. Okay? That's not really the idea here, but Okay. <laughs> You know, the amount of things like that, I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't ha want to have to deal with annoying people in annoying situations. <laughs> and I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us are in that same place. I don't want to deal with that, God. Don't make me do that. Give me a job that I can do, that I can just kind of, and it's in my comfort zone, and it's something that I'm familiar with. What if God has us do something that is out of our comfort zone? So in closing, just a few, a few last things. There is nothing wrong with growing. You might say, okay, you gave a list about things that mature Christians, you know, or maturing Christians do. I'm not there yet. That's okay. There is absolutely nothing wrong with, being a gro with growing. It's okay that you're not there yet. That's fine. This is the problem. Thinking you don't need to grow. There's the problem. If you think, oh man, I'm just not there yet, that's good. That means there's a level of humility in you that you realize, man, I just really need to grow. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But God forbid the day that we ever reach the place where we say, man, I have arrived. I am God's gift to the world and only people could be as enlightened as me. If only they could just hear me talk, I would bless them. The problem is thinking you don't need to grow. Reading your Bible Going to church, paying tithes, praying, those are good things. Those are, these, those are good things, but that's basic. That's day one. Th these are just things that you should be doing. That, I mean, that's just, okay, fine, you know, grow. All right, but that's a starting point, not the finishing point. It's not an end in and of itself. You understand what I'm saying? We, we pay tithes. Why pay tithes? God doesn't need our money to honor God with our money. We pay tithes to pay for the ministries that we do. We pay tithes to support the ministers. Th these are all good reasons, but it's not an, in, an end in and of itself. We read our Bible, oh, well, that's good, but, but why do we read our Bible? To learn about God and to learn about what we should be doing with our lives. We don't read a Bible just so that we can mark something off on a list. Praying is good and it's even necessary. In fact, praying is such an essential thing that it kind of repeats over on itself. It's the starting point. When, when you first get saved, you pray. But then there's a certain level of growth that you plateau if you don't have a growing prayer life. You understand what I'm saying? Especially when you get into ministry. This is what it looks like. You pray. God calls you to ministry. You think, I'm doing okay. And then you try and just keep with that same old prayer life while doing ministry. And it doesn't work and you fail. You have to now repeat the thing about prayer. Well, I already started with prayer. Yeah, and you got to get even more prayer than you had before. Because otherwise, you dry up and you, you, you kind of drift off. But anyways, you get my, what I'm saying. 
These things are good, but they're basic. They're the starting point, not the finishing point. God wants us to grow, not become prideful. God wants us to love, not be a judge and jury. You with me on that? God wants us to grow in love, not be prideful and be the judge and jury. You, can, you see the difference of focus there? One is focusing on me and my goodness. One is focusing on God and God and his goodness. Complete change of perspective. Be known for love, not fixing the culture. Somewhere along the line, I want to say it was probably in 312, when Constantine the Great took over and made Christianity a part of the empire, it's kind of just gotten worse ever since then. Christianity has been associated with a nation. The great thing about Christianity is it wasn't supposed to be associated with a nation. Oh, well, we're a Christian nation. You're not supposed to look at it like that. At all. Christianity is supposed to transcend the culture. To transcend loyalties to a flag. It's supposed to be set apart from that. It's fine to love your country. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem isn't having two masters. Or at the end of the day, you are either a Christian or you're an American. At the end of the day, you will have to choose loyalty. And God is the one who deserves our loyalty. Because one of these days, this nation will fall like every nation falls. Even if it makes it till the time of the rapture, it's still going to be destroyed by fire. So don't hold on too tight. <laughs> Everything we build will be destroyed by fire. So be known for love. Not fixing the culture. There's a lot of times we feel like if I don't say it, they won't know what right and wrong is. I have to correct them. I have to fix it. They have to know that there is a standard of right and wrong. They will know you are Christians by fixing the culture. No. They will know you are Christians by always having to offer you two cents whenever they're stuck in sin. No. They will know you are Christians by their love. They will know that you are Christians by your love. By your love. My microphone's dead. See, I've been... This one, Ben. This other one. Hello. Hello. See, I've been going so long now, the technology's telling me to stop. <laughs> like I said, a mind of its own. Siri, how long have I been going? Too long. <laughs> if you don't love people... <laughs> if you don't love people who you have seen, you can't love those that you haven't seen. God sent people my way. Do you love the people that are always already there? And also, I'm oh, sorry, if you don't love people uh, you have seen, you can't love God who you have not seen. And uh, one more thing I want to read. It's from Philippians chapter 2. It says in verse 1, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. And then hop down to verse 3 there. Uh, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Do nothing, nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. As more important than yourself. Wow. And then in verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. But also for the interests of others. If you read this in the Greek. I talked about this in young adults class. Last Tuesday I believe. It should read something like this. Do not look out for your own interests. But look out for other people's interests. The Greek doesn't imply. Do not merely look out. That, that's something that. I usually agree with the NASB. I do not agree with it here. The idea is do not look out for your own interests. In other words, you are looking out for your own interest. Don't look out for your own interests. Well, if I don't watch out for number one, nobody will. Okay, fine. That's fine. Don't look out for number one. Look out for the interests of others. Whoa. Well, that's a little bit different. So we're going to close off there. And I, you know, I'm just trying to be transparent here. I'm not saying this in a way to judge all of you. This is what I have learned last year. Because I had it stuck in my head, hey, I'm a good Christian. I, 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 have, I have marked off all this stuff. 
But when you read in the Bible what it actually means to be a good Christian, it's a little bit different than we think. Knowing all you want about the Bible but not loving anybody, that's not really going to get you very far at all. Did Jesus just kind of camp out on a mountain and say, hey, if anybody wants to know knowledge, they're just going to come up here. I'm God, so I already have all the answers. Or does it say in Luke 4 that he went to the synagogues? He went out and touched the sick. He went. Look at how much of Jesus' ministry is spent on the streets. Look at how much of Jesus' ministry is spent with people that you shouldn't associate with if you're a good person. So I, I really hope that this has challenged you because it really has been a challenge for me to learn these things. And, you, you know, I do want to say that loving someone isn't about a feeling. It's not necessarily that you feel, you know, this strong passion for them. Loving somebody is, is about a lifestyle. Loving somebody is about a choice. Those of you who are married, you know this. When you first get married, you have all kinds of feelings and emotions for somebody. But and then you get older, and I mean, it's not that you don't love them, it's just that feelings fade. I mean, you can't always be a teenager, you know. Eventually, feelings do fade. But love is about sacrificing yourself. It's about looking out for their best interest. Not about always feeling something for them, but sacrificing yourself for them. You, you see what I'm saying? And that's the same in ministry. It's not about... Well, I just have a heart for them. What if you don't? You still have to love them, even if you don't have a heart for them. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because I'm done talking. My throat hurts, and I am tired, and I know you guys are tired. So let's, let's go eat, huh? Uh, can 